Great to see you this morning. It's lovely weather, isn't it? Lovely weather. Lots of people in shorts. Dave was absolutely shocked by my pink shorts. Remember the day? That's how it's happening. Um, so, obviously, uh, this uh, week we've started our first sort of time going through uh, a book of the Bible, and our desire is that we begin every day to wrestle with some of the words and get involved in some of the words um, uh, that's, uh, that we have in front of us. Um, I told Betsan this at the start of the week, and she took it really, really seriously. Uh, and now this is my Bible. Um, I actually had to take this page together this morning she decided to write out. So she was really literal about wrestling with the Bible. I don't recommend it. It's quite a pain, actually. But there we are. Um, on the point of kids, um, as I said a couple of weeks ago, we want this to be a family church. We want kids to feel comfortable in here, in this space. So if they are making noise, if they're moving around, thank you, exhibit A. Um, don't panic. If they do get a bit rowdy, if you want to feed them, if you want a bit of a time out, um, we have in the back room here, we've got some toys out, some slides and stuff that they can go and play on. If you do want to take them out the back, please just make your way through, don't panic, but please don't worry too much about the noise. It's, you know, I, I, I believe she's saying amen, that's what I believe in in my heart. Oh, she's, uh, she's, in, she's encouraging me, come on, let me play. Um, so let's tuck in, I don't want to take too long with Galatians, because the aim now is that obviously we've got tables for reasons, that you would turn and you would discuss what you uh, learnt, what you found difficult, what you found exciting, encouraging, whatever it is, in the book of Galatians. So I'm going to break it down, I guess, into a bit of an intro, uh, and then I'm just going to encourage you guys to, hey, go away, maybe answer these few questions. What did you like about the book of Galatians? What did you find confusing about the book of Galatians? And what questions would you ask now off the back of the book of Galatians? And so that's what we'll be discussing in our uh, groups. Um, let's just pray as we dive into the word. Jesus, we thank you so much for, um, for the Bible. We thank you for the blessing it is. We thank you that in it we find your living words, Father. We find the things that give us strength, that give us peace, that give us joy, that give us direction. So, Father, now as we look at this book of Galatians, as we try to understand it a little bit better, we pray that you would give us hearts and minds that would be open to receive what you want to say. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, let's uh, dig in. First of all, I just want to say uh, Galatians is most likely Paul's first letter. What I found really helpful, which you might want to do when you go home, is reading through Acts 13 and 14. Acts is obviously uh, involved some of Peter and Luke going around. It's, uh, Acts was written by Luke, the Gospel of Luke, it literally follows straight on into Acts. Um, and it involves the story of the evangelization, the spreading of the Christian message post. Uh, just after Jesus has come and the Pentecost had happened and fire on the heads and the Holy Spirit had come, all of that sort of stuff, this is where the church goes. And Acts just tells the story of what happens. And in Acts 13 and 14, we see um, Paul going to the region of Galatia. Now, it's important, this book of Galatians is to a place. It's not to Mountain Ash. It's to Galatia, which is the Cumberland Valley. Paul's writing to a region which had numerous churches and different places within it. So, in Acts 13 and 14, we read that he goes to Antioch of Pisidia. He goes first of all, and they preach first of all to the temple, then to the whole town and then the whole region. Then they go to Iconium, which he speaks at the temple. Uh, some people liked it, some people didn't, and they were kicked out of the town because they wanted to be stoned. I'm not joking. Uh, then they go on to Lyceonia, which is again a region, two cities, Lystra and Derby. I'm saying this so that when you're reading it, you're going, where the heck am I? You're still in Galatia. As he's mentioning these towns, he's like going Abraham, Mountain Ash, Aberdeer, Trichonus. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I went to these different places and I spoke. And in the city of Lystra, he performs miracles. Paul performs, performs miracles and people think they're Greek gods. He heals someone and people go, oh my word, it's Zeus. Oh my word, it's Hermes. I think it's Hermes, not the parcel delivery phone. It's not, it hasn't been going that long. Although sometimes it feels like it takes that long to get your parcel, right? From Hermes. Sorry, Hermes, if someone watches from Hermes, what's this for me? Um, for slander. Uh, so, uh, and, and Paul and, and, and um, who's with him? Silas, I don't know what his name is. Simon, check it out, what's, your, what's up reading? Barnabas. Barnabas, is it? 
Anyway, Paul with one of his companions, didn't have that in notes, did I? Uh, Paul with one of his companions, they go and they're preaching and they're, they, they, go, they go, no, 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 we're not gods. We're not gods. We come in the name of the God, the only God, the one that has the power. And so then the Jewish leaders, because in every town they've been kicked out by the Jewish leaders, the Jewish leaders from these other places go, oh, we're going to rock up and put them in a bit of trouble. So the Jewish leaders come up and they literally drag Paul, go on, Barnabas, thank you. They drag Paul and stone him and drag him out of the town thinking he's dead. If you think you've had a bad day telling your friend about Jesus, I promise you it wasn't that bad. He is literally, they go, ah, oh, these Jews come, they get the people in that area to, on their side and they go, oh, those people, they deserve to be stoned. They stone Paul, they drag him out, they think he's dead. The, the, his followers gather around him. Paul gets up and goes back into the town. <laughs> Fair play. Fair play. So Paul ends up back in the town. The next day they go, let's move on to the next town, shall we? Probably a sensible decision. And they make their way down to Derby. Um, and again, he preaches in Derby. I think that's maybe how they pronounce it. Derby County. They preach in Derby County and he makes many disciples. Um, and then they return, and basically Paul goes there, 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 and then he goes back to all the places on the way back. He puts elders in place, he encourages the church, and that's the first of his missionary journeys done. His first missionary journey is done to Galatia, and this is the book he writes to them. Why is that important? Well, because knowing what he's gone through in Galatia, it's no surprise what comes up in the book of Galatians. It's no surprise. Chapters, uh, uh, so where am I? Sorry. Starts uh, the, the first couple of chapters in Galatians. He's saying, you are listening to a false gospel of the strict, uh, zealous Jews who are trying to make you live a different gospel. That's not surprising now that you know the backstory, is it? The fact that he was attempted to be stoned twice and what it actually happened. The first thing he does when he writes the letter back to these churches, he's going, don't listen to those people who, by the way, tried to kill me the last time I was there. So all of a sudden we start to understand the context of why Paul is saying this about this false gospel and these false teachers. He's not saying this out of some sort of, oh, sort of, oh off the cuff, or oh, don't do it. He's, he's experienced the idea of false teachers of these people at the time, the Jewish leaders at the time, who were so zealous and so angry and so bitter towards this new message. They went as far as trying to kill someone to stop it being taught. So Paul, first of all, starts by addressing uh, the, the Jewish population and he's saying he comes to the Galatians to challenge them and encourage them he says the true gospel is beautiful it is free that is a really important part of the book of Galatians it is the undercurrent of everything that Paul comes to say in this book he's saying the gospel that we believe in the gospel that comes from Jesus through faith in what Jesus did on the cross brings freedom it brings freedom. You're not bound by laws. You're not restricted by this weight of expectation. It's not because of what you've done. It's because of what Jesus did. And that's what Paul is saying. But he starts first of all going, guys, that stuff that they're trying to teach you, it's a mess. It's not the gospel. It's oppressive. And it's not what Jesus came to teach. So then secondly, he goes on to mention their identity in God. He goes on to, to, to tell them that being a Christian is not second-rate Judaism. Because at the time, the argument was this. The Jews believed that they were the people of God, and that the Gentiles were dirty sinners, and that you couldn't just become a Jew, because, and you couldn't just step into the promise, because God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that was for them. That was their right. So can you imagine, all of a sudden, people are saying, well, I believe in this. God of Israel, and I believe in Jesus, and I'm actually part of you, and these Jews are going, no, you're not. You're not one of us. You don't get our promises. You don't get that special stuff that God gave us. And so what Paul says about their identity is that you have the same promises that God gave the Jews back then. He was basically speaking directly to the people who were getting angry at the Christians and going, listen, pal, they're one of you now. And can I say, it's really important in terms of Jewish-Christian relations now to understand that we have been grafted in, that's what Paul says in a different book, in a different book he writes. He says we've been grafted in to the promises of Israel. We receive the promises that God gave to Abraham, 
The promise that he would be their God and they would be their people. The promise that he would be with them and never forsake them. Those promises are promises to the Jewish people, to the Israelite people. And so what does Paul, how does Paul describe it? In a way that we can all understand. He says that you have been adopted. He says that you have been adopted into the family of God. He, Jesus doesn't just go, oh yeah, well, these are, these are my main people and these guys are like second rate. He says, no, you're part of the family. And that's our message. We're part of the family. When we read Galatians, we see someone so passionate for Christians to truly understand who they are. And we live in the same day to day. We live in a way that, in, in, a, in a society where Christians don't know what they can say and they don't know who they are. They don't know the power they have and the freedom that they have. But Paul is saying, if you knew who you were, if you knew the promises that were spoken over your life, not because of who you are, not because of your title or your grandfather or your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, but because of Jesus. Because of Jesus you've been adopted well, into the family. You don't miss out on the promises. You're not going to miss out on the things that they have. We're part of it and we receive these incredible promises. And because we are part of them, Paul points out, there should be unity because Jesus made a way for unity. There should be unity because Jesus made a way. That was his desire. Paul goes on, I think he's in another, another book, he says, there were Jews and Gentiles, but my Jesus' goal was to create one man out of the two people. Warring people. And we can, we can look at this and maybe go, okay, I don't quite understand why the Jewish people relate to me. It, this is where you find the beauty of the Old Testament. If you've ever read the Old Testament and thought, why does this matter? Jesus is alive, guys. It doesn't matter. The Old Testament is beautiful because it shows everything that we've been grafted into. It shows us our family history now. It shows us the depths that God would go for us because he went for that for Israel again and again and again and again and again. He loves us so much. And even the God of the Old Testament, who sometimes people think is evil or horrible or, or, or wrath, full of wrath, he was a loving God and he desired that we would know him through Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying to the Christians. Don't be pressured. Don't lose sight of what the gospel is. And can I say that to you today? Don't lose sight of what the gospel is. Even in, in us reading the Bible every day, that we could put a little bit of religion on that. We could put a bit of pressure on that and say, well, I have to do it because, because everyone else is. We're inviting religion back into something that God says, and Paul says here is for freedom. So then the third thing that Paul does, so the first thing he addresses the Jewish elders. The second thing is he says your identity, you are adopted, you are God's son, you are God's daughter. You have identity in him. And the third thing, he talks about the freedom and the power of the Spirit. First of all, he says that a life in Christ is not one of bondage, bondage to law and rules. And second of all, he says, the way you live out a life following Jesus is through the power of the Spirit, through the fruits of the Spirit, through the things that he gives us. We don't do it on our own. He empowers us to do it. So you've heard what he's done, verse, uh, chapters 1 to 4 really get us to that place. Listen to what Galatians 5, the first verse of Galatians 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be, uh, be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Do you hear what? Now you know some of the backstory. Now you know the difficulties that Paul went through. Now you know the, the Jewish... Can you see why Paul is saying this? Mm -hmm. We live in a culture that tells us we have to think certain things and say certain things and we can't say other certain things. We know the pressure of a society that tells us to live a certain way. Paul was speaking to the same society, except back then they were being forced to follow Jewish customs. Circumcision, the 630 laws, following the yearly uh, hol uh, holidays and celebrations. And the Jews were saying, you have to do that to be a part of us. You have to do that to be saved. And Paul was going, don't fall back into that. Jesus has saved you from that, into freedom. It was for freedom that Christ has set you free. So don't receive the freedom of God and step back into bondage. Don't do it. We can find ways to do it even today. 
We can find ways to put pressure on ourselves about our own behaviour, about the things that we do, even about attending church on a Sunday, which is great. All those things are wonderful, living righteously, attending church. But if it's bondage, then we're missing something. And that's what Paul's saying. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. So, the story of Galatians, three points. First of all, the gospel of Jesus is about freedom. It's about freedom. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we are no longer bound by the law. And he, Jesus, is the most important thing. Not what you do, not what you say, not the things you fulfill, not all that sort of stuff. It's about Jesus. Start first with Jesus. Secondly, your freedom is found in being a child of God. Your freedom is isn't found in being a good person, by the way. Your freedom isn't found in being a great dad or wife or husband or whatever it is. Although I would encourage you to be the best you can. It's not found there. Your freedom isn't found in your bank balance, in the car you drive, in the house you live in. In fact, if anything, those things are bondage. Your freedom is found in your identity in Christ. You might have been watching the football last night. Uh, you might not have. But you, many of you might have heard on the news that a player collapsed and received CPR on the pitch. Me and Simon were in football group, WhatsApp groups, and we got non-Christians going, guys, we need to be praying for this guy. I wasn't watching at the time. I turned on the TV, and you, the, you can see someone being defib on the pitch. It was incredible. Yeah, they, they circled around him. But you could still see the movements of the paramedics giving CPR. And in that moment, it became more than football. It became this serious thing. It became life and death. It became, what does it mean? What is life about? What is this freedom? What is this bondage and in the face of death sometimes you saw in some footballers faces the hands come out to pray because in the depths of despair we know there's something more we know there's something to call out for but when you're a child of God when you know who your dad is it doesn't matter what goes wrong it doesn't matter when a loved one dies there is difficulty and there is pain and you have to face it and you have to grieve but the faith and the hope when someone knows Jesus, when they're a child of God, it blows it away. It blows it away. You see the peace that people have. Uh, in fact, the last time something like this happened, the player collapsed on the pitch and the guy jumped a roof around him. I heard him speak at my church a few years after it happened. A man full of faith. Do you know what? He woke up, the only thing he could speak in was tongues. He could only speak in tongues, couldn't speak. He, was, he, he, he had no oxygen in his body for about 78 minutes. He could walk, he could talk, he could find. He said his family were praying. People gathered around him. He spoke in tongues when he woke up. That's all he could do. And then his body just began to return. And he now tells his testimony. Why? Because there's something about being a child of God. Even when the worst things happen, we have, a, we have a grand foundation we can stand on. So that's what Paul says. Your freedom is found in being a child of God. Don't get caught up in titles who your dad is, who your granddad is, where you were born, what church you go to, it's Jesus, it's who, that you are his son, you are his daughter. It's found in him. And because of that, we're part of the family. If you've got a family, we're part of the family, that's what Paul's saying. So thirdly, uh, so firstly, the story of Galatians is there's freedom in the gospel. Secondly, the freedom is found in your identity in Christ. And thirdly, God's spirit gives us all we need to live faithfully. In verse 19 in chapter 5 or 6, it says, the Lord, the Lord doesn't help us avoid sin, it merely shows us what our sin is. The Lord was never created for us to, uh, to, to help us, it was just created to go, look how dirty you are, you need a saviour. That's the whole point of it, we can't be saved by it. But it's by the Holy Spirit placing that, that moment of conviction on your heart. That wasn't right, I need to repent, I need to say sorry. I need to change. The Holy Spirit, which will help me change. We looked at transformation last week as Nori's message. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit changes our lives as we acknowledge Him, we acknowledge our wrongdoing and say, God, will you help me change, be transformed into the image of your Son? So that's the message of Galatians. It's a book written by a bloke who went through a heck of a lot. To say, it doesn't matter what people around you are saying, it doesn't matter what they're telling you to do, find your faith and find your freedom in the Son of God. 
as he tells you who you are, you can live a life not of bondage, but of freedom. And that's the message of Galatians. So, we're going to spin our chairs around now. I hope that was a helpful introduction, a hopeful uh, an overview of what Galatians is about. Maybe you should read some of the passages now. Uh, they might stand out in a bit more light or so. Um, I encourage you to share now as we turn around favourite verses, maybe a verse that you've highlighted or written down that you've enjoyed. Um, yeah, those three questions. What did I like? What didn't I get? What confused me? And what question would I ask now on top of it? Guys, there's no time limit, so to speak, here. Uh, take your time, enjoy one another, chat, catch up, don't just talk about the Bible, see how people are. Um, and yeah, we'll play some music in the background too. And that's it. Wunderbar, lovely. I just read it. I just read it.